Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's talk on Crane, Uber's next-gen infrastructure stack. We're going to go into a lot of interesting details, but if there's one thing you take away from this presentation, I hope it's this. Automation is king. Whatever workflows you have, whatever operations you're doing, automating them is going to give you outsized returns. This is the biggest lesson I've learned in all my years working on infrastructure. I'm Curtis Nussbaum. I'm a senior staff software engineer at Uber. And before we get into all that, let's go back in time to 2018. Uber was scaling like crazy. We were buying servers left and right to try and keep up with the traffic demand. And frankly, our infrastructure was buckling under the load. We found that we were running into three broad categories of issues. The first set of issues had to do with what we call zone turnup or zone creation. Like many operators of big server fleets, Uber partitions their servers into zones or availability zones or whatever you want to call them. We do this to reduce the risk of a correlated failure. We don't want a single power event taking out like half our server fleet. We want to be able to localize those faults. But as we were creating more and more zones to accommodate the increasing size of our fleet, we kept running into the same set of problems. For one thing, our infrastructure stack actually had a lot of circular dependencies in it. What I mean by this is that component A might have a dependency on component B, but then component B wouldn't be able to run unless component A was also up and running. To give you a concrete example, we had a set of software that we used to provision new servers, but that software ran on our compute stack. And we couldn't get our compute stack up and running until we had some servers provisioned. We ran into stuff like this all the time when turning up new zones, and we had to do lots of hacks to work around it. Also, just the process of turning up new zones usually costs us hundreds of engineers across the entire infrastructure org and months of time. As we were scaling and scaling more, this wasn't going to cut it for us. We needed to be able to turn up zones faster. The second category of issues we were running into had to deal with just our day-to-day -day operations. First, just provisioning servers in and of itself was a manual process. For most teams, what it meant was going to a web UI and going through a series of drop-down menus to configure whatever servers it was they were trying to get into production. As we were thinking about scaling to thousands or hundreds of thousands of servers, this was not going to cut it either. We did have an API backing this web UI, and there was some automation behind it, but a lot of teams didn't know that the API even existed, and the automation was rickety at best. Remediating the servers when problems inevitably arose in production was also a manual endeavor. In fact, it was even worse than that. Teams were left to their own devices when it came to determining if their hardware was even healthy in the first place. And most teams had their own bespoke, custom flows for dealing with problems when they arose. We also just had a really hard time keeping track of all of our servers. We had what we call the host catalog that was a dubious quality. The access controls on it were pretty loose and we often really couldn't trust what we found in there. Lastly, all of this was specific to our on-prem data centers. This really left us with our hands tied when it came to taking advantage of anything that the cloud might be able to offer us. So with all of this in mind, we set out to design our ideal infrastructure stack. And the guiding principle through all of this was we wanted to reduce operational overhead through automation. So from the very beginning, from day one, zone turn up itself should be automated. Once we had zones turned up, we should be able to scale the size of our fleet to something 
order of hundreds of thousands of servers. Now, when you get to a server fleet this large, you need a few things. First, your servers need to all be fairly homogenous. They need to be running relatively the same amount of software. If you start letting bespoke or custom configurations creep in, things get out of hand pretty quickly. We also wanted to be able to treat our servers as cattle, not pets. And what I mean by that is that we shouldn't have any special servers that need to be treated differently than most of the other servers in our fleet. If I can do a set of operations on one host, I should be able to do that same set of operations on every single host in my fleet. Remediation of problems when they arise should be completely automatic. Teams should not be left on their own in terms of determining when problems arise or how to fix them. We should have a single central standard solution for dealing with hardware issues. And lastly, we want all of this to work equally well in our on-prem data centers and in the cloud. And in addition to that, we should work equally well regardless of the cloud provider that we're running on. So let's dive into the details of some of these. Like I mentioned, we wanted automation from the very beginning, including zone turnup. What this meant for us is that the zone should actually be able to build itself, much in the same way that a tower crane builds itself, hence the namesake. In order to orchestrate this zone bootstrapping, we ended up building our own infrastructure as a code framework. This framework allowed us to codify and when I say codify, I mean literally, in Go code, follow a set of principles that we call layer cake. Layer cake, in essence, says that if I make a graph of all of my various software components and then draw edges between those components that represent dependencies, I should end up with a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. I.e., there shouldn't be any cycles in my dependency graph. And Podfix is essentially a codified expression of this layer cake framework. If you want to read a little bit more about layer cake, I highly recommend checking out the companion blog post that we have for this presentation. I'll share a link for it at the end. All of this taken together allowed us to turn up a new zone with a single engineer and a laptop in just a few days. So we went from hundreds of engineers across the entire infrastructure work and months of time to single engineer, laptop, and a few days. Pretty impressive if I do say so myself. Furthermore, this whole framework had plugins for both our on-prem data centers and our cloud zones. And the cloud code had plugins for each of the different cloud providers that we wanted to run on. So we would make one abstraction for a particular operation that we wanted to do, say, for instance, setting up a network load balancer. And then we would have different implementations for each cloud provider that we run on. This allowed us to keep our overall code the same over time while simply adding in new implementations for every new cloud provider that we wanted to onboard to. All right. so. We've got some zones turned up now. How do we actually make use of all the servers sitting in those zones? What we wanted was a way to move servers into operation with zero friction. The way we set about doing this was actually creating a goal state system that we call credits. We had a pool of available servers that were sitting, ready, waiting to be assigned in production. And then to actually move them to where they needed to go, we would create a new goal state entry. This entry consisted of a three tuple that included the group we wanted the host to move into, the number of servers that we wanted to be assigned to the group, and then the type of server that should be assigned. So for example, we might say the Compute01 host group should get 300 servers of type N2D. We then had a process called assigner that just constantly monitors our goal state. And whenever it notices a change or an unsatisfied goal state, it'll take servers from our available pool and move them to where they need to go. And as it does this, it will do its best to respect internal fault domains as much as possible. 
What this means, for example, in our on-prem data centers is that we'll try to be cognizant of the racks in which the hosts that we're assigning are located. So in my previous example, I'm not going to try and bin pack all those 300 hosts into, say, the exact same three racks. I'm going to try to get them distributed throughout as many different racks as possible. That way, if there is a rack level failure, it will have minimal impact on the individual host groups. To solve the problem of host provisioning, we actually just obviated the problem completely. All of our hosts come pre-provisioned with the exact same operating system and the exact same set of packages installed. We call this configuration our golden image. And it's actually enforced by a really cool piece of open source software called Dominator. What Dominator does is it looks at the file system specified in the golden image and then scans all the servers in our fleet and makes sure that each of their file system also matches. If it notices any deviations, it simply reverts the change on the host. So if someone comes in and installs a software package that isn't part of our golden image, Dominator will just automatically revert that within a few minutes. This same mechanism also allows us to centrally push out updates. I just simply change the golden image that Dominator is enforcing. All of my servers will now become out of date and Dominator will gradually, over time, bring them in sync with the new golden image. As we're signing and moving these hosts around, we're also tracking all of these state changes in a high quality host catalog. This thing was completely new. We built it from the ground up just for Crane. And it has really tight access controls, which in no small part contributes to a much higher quality of data that we can find within this version of our host catalog. Most of the time, humans aren't even allowed to operate on the catalog itself. It's pretty much just computers and automated systems. We put a bunch of safeguards in place to make sure that people can't futz around with the data that's in here. This gives us high confidence in the data that's located in the catalog. And I can't tell you how useful that is when it comes to debugging problems. Being able to know what a given server is doing at any given point in time with high confidence is incredibly useful. All right, so we've got a bunch of servers. They're in production. Problems are gonna inevitably happen. But before we can deal with those, we actually have to define what are problems in the first place? What does it mean for a server's hardware to be unhealthy? This, it turns out, is actually a fairly nuanced question. First, you need to pick what kind of signals you wanna monitor. And then for each of those signals, what kind of thresholds and time periods should you look at to determine whether or not the various hardware components are healthy? Let's take, for example, a stick of RAM, just a DIM. How do I know whether or not that DIM is healthy? One thing you might want to monitor is ECC error count. OK, well, what threshold do you want to monitor at? Is 10 ECC errors bad? Is 100 ECC errors bad? And what time window are you going to look over? 10 ECC errors over the course of a year is one thing. But 10 ECC errors over the course of the last minute, well, that's very different. But once we had all the signals that we wanted to monitor and all the various thresholds that we wanted to look at for them, we were kind of off to the races. Then it was just a matter of scanning our servers periodically and checking the hardware signals. So we built a component called Bad Host Detector, and it scans the fleet approximately every five minutes. And it just looks at every single hardware signal that we care about for each host. If any of those hardware signals are in breach of our predefined threshold, we then file an issue for that server in a central host issues database. Quick side note. Having a database with a track record of all the hardware problems you've ever encountered in production is incredibly useful. You can go back and you can look for patterns and you can find really interesting patterns of failure over time. We then have a third component called Host Activity Manager that monitors this host issues database. Whenever it notices a new open issue, it then via an API works with the owner of that host to, as 
gracefully as possible and drain workloads off of that host. Once all the workloads are drained, it then removes the host into a remediation workflow. That remediation workflow looks a little different in the cloud versus on-prem. In the cloud, it's simply just terminate the VM. It's that simple. We'll let the cloud provider deal with whatever underlying issues are actually going on there. On-prem, it's a lot more complicated. It involves communicating the problems that we've detected to actual humans on the ground in our data centers, and then having those actual humans go out and conduct repairs. That's a whole other complicated process that we could just do an entire talk on its own on. So just doing a quick recap, what we've seen is that Uber has built automation throughout their entire infrastructure stack. From the very beginning, we automate our zone turnup all the way to our day-to-day -day operations, which are now more or less fully automated all the way to detecting any problems as they arise throughout the lifespan of our particular of our zones. So where does this bring us today? Well, today our server fleet spans across several different on-prem zones, as well as zones located in two different cloud providers. And with all of this, we've been able to scale our server fleet to just shy of 250,000 servers. Not too shabby, if you ask me. Looking forward to the future, I see two main challenges for us. The first is taking advantage of the elastic capacity that the cloud offers us. Crane is actually well poised to take advantage of this with that goal state system I talked about previously. If we want to scale up or scale down, it's simply a matter of changing that goal state. But what we really need are high quality signals that tell us when to do that scale up and scale down. This will involve us working with our partners above and above us in the stack the workload schedulers, i.e. the Kubernetes folks, so that they can give us high quality signals when we should change their respective goal states. If it's a Friday night and we're seeing tons of users come online and requesting rides, we need the workload schedulers to tell us that. We need the workload schedulers to tell us that the workloads are currently under stress and they need more resources. And then if it's Sunday morning and things are kind of dying down after a busy weekend, we need the workload schedulers to tell us that, hey, things have let up. You can go ahead and scale us down. We also want to be able to become a little more flexible in terms of the location in which we ingest new servers. Right now, Uber is primarily based in two regions, DCA in Aspern, Virginia, and PHX in Phoenix, Arizona. But utilizing servers outside of those two geographical regions is currently quite challenging for us. Now, there's two reasons why we might want to do this, or at least two main reasons I can think of. The first is cost. DCA in particular, Ashburn, Virginia, is pretty expensive to operate in. So we'd like to be able to take advantage of servers that cost less in regions like, say, the central United States. The second reason is server types. So for instance, GPUs are in very, very high demand right now. And they might not always be available in the geographical regions in which we're currently deployed. So if there's 100 available GCUs in Singapore, we want to be able to take advantage of that. That's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for coming to this presentation. I hope it was insightful and you learned a lot. And of course, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer them. Thank you so much.